Hi again, and we are almost ready to welcome our next speaker. Uh, this is going to be Ziv from WellApp, and right now we are connecting to him. Hi, Ziv. How do you do? Hello, hello. Good. You? All right. Also good. Where are you based? I'm talking to you uh, from home in Israel. Great. I guess it's super warm there, right? Right. You are Dis opening the swimming season. Disgustingly so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's so bad that we have to work and have to be here and not like swimming and enjoying the sun. <laughs> 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 so um, I'm passing my word to you. Let's get it going to your presentation. We're excited for it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, good uh, afternoon, evening, morning, depending on where you are. My name is Ziv. I'm the director of product management uh, at WellUp. And today I want to speak to you about how to know what players want uh, without wasting uh, your time. And basically what we're going to discuss is playtesting. And more precisely, how to do playtesting and how to work with testers uh, when you don't have any research background or anal analysis background or, or psychological background, right? So the main thing to remember is why we're making games, right? And it's, it might be a stupid question, but there are so many reasons to make a game. And we need to take a moment and just observe and understand where we're coming from, right? There are several things that, we, that could be. Uh, basic one, if you have a company, it's money. You, you want to make money and you want to do it through games. That's the most uh, basic form of, of creating a company. If you don't want to make money, obviously you'll be some artist, you'll create some uh, indie uh, experiments and you'll push those games and that's not your uh, source of revenue and that's fine. Uh, but if you're making money, you need to understand that there's a lot that you need to uh, take into consideration in the following step that I'll discuss in a minute. Another reason is to entertain. We want to entertain the people. Uh, it can be for various uh, uh, reasons. Maybe uh, an altruistic one. We just want to create games again because I'm a creator and I want to make people happy. Uh, it can be to entertain them to make revenue. Uh, and this is a very good reason to, to make a game. Uh, a third reason could be basically uh, that it's a need. We're artists. We really want to create games. And those games are not necessarily uh, entertaining, right? We have the serious game genre. We have all kinds of experiments and experiences that use game mechanics uh, to convey messages. And each one of these reasons uh, is very understandable and it's very clear. And it's also very about us and who we are. But there is one thing that we have to remember no matter where we're coming from when we create games. And that is the biggest mystery. What, what is the biggest mystery? The number one thing that we usually don't think about immediately when we create games, right? And that is the players. Uh, sounds stupid, but for the majority of us, when we create games, uh, we tend to think about players at a very late stage. Uh, when we have a mechanic in mind, usually it would be, depending on the company that you're from, it can be that research showed that this specific game uh, or genre can make uh, a profit, and that's why we should go for it. Uh, it can be that you have an idea in mind that you really want to create and you want to push out, right, a need. Uh, or in general, you think about, you know, people, you think about players, obviously, well, you're making a product for them, you want to entertain them, as I said earlier, but um, you don't think about the individual person. You think about the experience, you think about, you know, making it accessible, about making the first time user experience. We think about that. We don't really think about the players. We don't have an image in mind of that specific person, uh, he or she, who they are, and how will they interact and work with our game. And that's something that when you start working uh, with your products, with your games, and really dig into playtesting, that's something that really uh, vibrates and echoes as you follow up and as you see how people, individual people, specific people, not data points, right? Not uh, analytical uh, information that you're getting, but real people, how they interact and work with your game. 
So we really need to understand, you know, who are they and how will they react to our game and, and will they like the game and how will they, uh, you know, work with what we've created, with the set of tools that we've done. Uh, how will the tutorial affect them? How will the graphic uh, be in their eye? This, there's so much that we make into games. The reason that I love games, I'm sure that it's, it's true for you as well. The reason that we love making games is because it's such a complex kind of system. There are, there's no other art form or no other product that combines so much music and art and graphics and 3D and, and storytelling and, and, and obviously development. So much in one product, so much complexity. And all of this had to hit this sweet point that actually uh, reversed with the players that get the product at the end of the day. So when we look at the way that we build the game today, we focus on several verticals, right? We want to make sure that the development is there and we have tons of tools to make sure that development is done properly from the framework itself to the engine that we're using uh, from Jira, you know, the, the way that we break these things down. Uh, there's obviously the game design where we create the the, the, the game design documents and the way that we convey and explain the game to our other uh, team members. So much, so many tools there, right? Even if it's a basic, uh, just a, a way to, to write a document, but there's so much more there. If you're a 3D artist, again, so many tools to work with, so many things to help you create this perfect model that you can then send to your developer and, and put it into the game. There's the interface and so much that goes into making everything clear and crystal and obviously beautiful. And again, so many tools for that, so many tools. If you're a, a, a narratives creator, so many things that you can do today, especially today if you want to create complex and uh, uh, you know, a story that sprawls and, and goes all in all places. Uh, but then, you know, who do we look at last? We look at the players last. We sort of create everything. We make the experience. We make everything. And then we say, okay, now, now let's give it to a player. Now, now let's, let's send it out for a beta launch or a soft launch and see what happens with the game. Maybe they like it. Maybe they don't like it. I don't know. Let's, let's just see what happens. And our players are very, very complex individual at the end of the day. Even if we do have in mind, right, the, the perfect uh, audience, and we did our market research and we know who we're sending this to and maybe we have a very good uh, user acquisition agent and, and they can really target the kind of people that we know play these kind of games and this genre is very popular and we know these are the people who will love the game and we send it out and it doesn't work. And why? Because we have so many biases. We have so many things that we think we know and understand uh, and we fail our players. Uh, we think that they are us. We observe the games that they play and we then conclude things about them and we tell ourselves that because we ourselves play the game you know, that we've created and we played other games, we figure out that you know, we don't need any more information about those players. It would be enough to send the game out, uh, get the information from the various, again, tons of tools that we have to gather information uh, about how players behave within the game. And from there, we'll fix it, right? If, uh, if people don't, uh, if, if they churn out after level three, we'll uh, fix level three because obviously there's a problem there. If we see that they do not complete the tutorial, we'll fix the, the tutorial. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into all kinds of conclusions based on the raw data, data or the, the data that we sift through, uh, but you know, with large numbers, hundreds and thousands and maybe more than that of players that go through the game and then we, we make conclusion about, about who they are and why they made the choice that they made when playing our game. It's not right. <laughs> it's wrong. It's, it's a very strange way to look at that because, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a beautiful series of books by Isaac, by Isaac Asimov, uh, Foundation. And in Foundation, he speaks about this guy uh, who can foresee into the far future because he can look at the population of the human race in the future it's, it's sprawling millions of, of stars and he can foresee what they do as a race how the human race will behave and he's very very precise but you know it, it wouldn't be an interesting book if, if there's no drama and where does the drama come from 
from the specific individuals who take action, who make choices that uh, uh, that person, uh, you know, the seer cannot see. And this is where his plans break down and, you know, our heroes need to fix that. So we need to make the righteous and we need to understand the individual before we look at the large data sets that we get to really understand why people do what they do. And this is what playtesting is for. Um, we need to do that before we get to soft launch. A lot of companies, a lot of, of, of small developers think about the soft launch as the point where they'll test the game. Uh, they think soft launch, that that's the, the meaning of the, of the phrase, right? It's soft launch, it's not the global launch. We're testing it in one country. We're testing it in small scale. But that sometime is too late because when you are at soft launch, uh, there's a lot of money that went already into the development. And even if you're one person creating a game, uh, your, your time was invested in that. So many hours that you've worked on uh, uh, to create this experience, this game. And you want to take, you know, 100 days that you worked for uh, and then start fixing everything after that point instead of looking deeper and earlier into the things that you could have changed before that. It's expensive in, in human hours. It's expensive in money. And depending on the type of game that you created and the amount of mechanics that there is in it, uh, the amount could get, it could get to a point where you'll say to yourself, you know what, we'll, we'll make some superficial fixes and we sort of try to, to change this as we go uh, because it's, it will, it'll be just too much money uh, to start breaking down and fix everything that we think now we need to fix. So play test your game. That's the, the core thing that you need to understand. You have to play test your game and you have to do it as early as possible. And yeah, no, the other direction, thank you. So the way that we need to address this is to look for specific people, specific individuals that will be able to bring in and work with them to test the game and actually allow them to experience as much as we can at any given moment, right? Because we're going to test our game at, at several uh, point in time. And when we work with these people, we really need to put our biases outside. We need to put everything that we know about the game and everything that we think about them as individuals, we have to put it aside and observe what's happening. That's the number one rule that you need to adhere to. If you want to really play test your game, you need to stop thinking about what you know and open yourself to the possibilities of everything that you do not know. And the, 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 the most annoying question that a person can ask himself is, what don't I know? Because when you know about specific things that you don't know, you can ask about them, right? If I don't know anything about marketing, I can say, hey guys, I don't know anything about marketing. Can you help me? I need to learn about A, B, or C. But what happens if there's something that you don't even know that's there? The only way to actually work through that and learn is just to allow yourself to understand that you don't know any, everything, that there are things that you're missing, and be observant. That's the number one tool that you have to adhere to. So what is the timing? How do we work our playtesting? So first of all, the prototyping phase. Prototype phase means that you'll have, depending on the type of game that you've created, uh, you'll uh, either have like a paper kind of, uh, of interaction or maybe uh, first playable, uh, maybe a test concept, maybe, maybe it's a presentation with some uh, interactable uh, click points, things that you, you can tap, players can tap and, and work around. And you need to ask yourself when you do a prototype is what are you actually testing in the prototype phase? Are you using a well-known mechanic and you want to create a meta game, a very, very rich meta game that never been seen before and that's what you want to test? Or perhaps the meta game is something that was tried, you know, and you know about it and you know it works and the core mechanic is something that you want to test. When you do the prototype, focus on the thing that you are not sure about and then test it with people. We'll get to how we test things in a moment. I just want to go first of all on, on the time frame of when and what are we testing at each 
uh, crossroads. So at the prototype phase, we want to allow people to test and play the things that we are not sure about. It's not about a complete experience. It's about the core thing that you don't understand and you don't know yet if you, uh, if you made right. At the alpha stage, you should have the core gameplay already uh, like on, on an app, on a real thing. People can actually play. It's not paper anymore. It's not first playable. It's the real thing. Uh, maybe it's not the, you know, the complete gra graphic. Obviously, the majority of you know what's an alpha. So you'll want to play the core game or the meta game. Uh, you want to see the direction of the, of the game. You want to see if people are interested in what you've created as initial experience. And at this stage, it has to be on the platform that you're already uh, going to launch the game on. You obviously have the beta where everything is there, the tutorial is there, the core interaction there, uh, uh, all the iterations are there and the experience is complete. Maybe it's not the best graphics, maybe there's a lot of things that you need to do with balance of the game, but at the beta stage, you want to test all these things before you uh, push them out. And again, when I say you test them, I say you test them with individual people at each and every stage. And in a moment, we'll discuss uh, the type of people that you bring into each phase. And more importantly, how do you bring them and what kind of tests you can do with them and how you should approach that. Uh, soft launch, you want to start testing your seven day gameplay, uh, the real interaction, the production uh, value itself to see how people perceive your game. Right, that's what you do in soft launch. Now, interesting enough, in soft launch, obviously you'll have more numbers because you'll have all the information that you're getting uh, from, from analytics, and you'll also have the people who do the play test, hopefully, and you'll have all of this combined to get the real information to understand what people think and do with your game. And ongoing, obviously, as you go, there's new features and there's balance changes and UI changes and economy changes, all kinds of stuff that you're doing. And at each stage, you do want to uh, start play testing even before you just launch it out. And how? So depending on the size and resources of your company, uh, the method will vary. Like if you have enough money and enough tools, you'll use something like uh, Play Test Cloud, play test cloud or uh, user testing that we're using, which are really great companies, but you know, working with them costs a lot of money. It can go from $100 to $1,000. And the cool thing about these companies is that you can reach, they have, they have a huge amount of players, and you can access those players without knowing them, right? That's the huge thing. You don't need to think about how do I get the play testers in? How do I work with that? Uh, you just build a test, and you push it out and people will find it from their uh, resources and, and come in. But that costs money. Uh, but you can actually do play testing for the price of pizza. That's the truth. You can actually do that uh, if you really care for your game and you really care for your product and you can do that fairly easily. Um, the, the, the number one question that I get is, okay, so, so it's easy and it, you don't have to pay a lot of money, but I'm not an analyst. Uh, uh, or, or, you know, I'm not a psychologist or I, I don't have background in research. How, how do I approach this? And, and this is our superpower as product people, as uh, game designers. Logic is going to be your way of breaking down and actually creating a test. Because at the end of the day, doing a play test is not that different than doing what you normally do when you work with people as product people, as designers. Think about it. You have a vision in your mind that you basically break down and then use to distribute between all these individual developers and 3D artists and UI and everything. So you are taking an emotional experience and you know how to write it down, and break it down to spread it so they can reconstruct your vision, your dream and build a product, something real that players can play. You can use the same logic, you can use the same tools uh, to start building the tests that you want to test. So let's go over the, the rules for testing players, all right? And the number one thing is, as I said, when you go to the prototype is that you can start from paper. You don't need anything fancy. You don't even need 
at the prototype stage, you don't even need a first playable. You can start from a concept, from a basic uh, paper concept. And what you need to think about are not the tools that you're going to use to show the game to people, but how are you going to show the game to the game to them, and how are you going to extract information from them? And the number one that thing that I want to tell you is make sure no matter where you're getting your people from, and we'll get that, uh, to that in a moment, make sure to lie to them. Um, at the end of the day, you want them to play with the game, right? Look at interaction, and you want to see what they're doing, but you want to make sure that they don't lie to you because they, want, uh, they don't want to hurt you. And as people, we, we are wired that way. If someone shows us, you know, this is my creation. This is something that I've made. This is, you know, I've put years and years into this. Please tell me that it's fine. Okay. Uh, nobody will tell you this sucks. Uh, specific people might say so. But most people will try to please, will try to be nice. And they will play and say, oh, that's, that's nice. That's okay. I like it. Yeah, you know, it's fine. You're going to make millions. Um, and that's not what we want. We want cold hard truth. So what we need to do is make sure that when we present ourselves to our testers, uh, to do that and in a way that doesn't tie you to the company as the creator. That's why I said you actually have to lie. You need to tell them, hi, I work for company B and we're helping this company uh, uh, to test their product. Uh, I'm not related to them in any ways. Um, this is my uh, third, fourth time seeing the game itself after I tested it myself. Uh, so really feel free to, to say whatever you want. Once you break that wall and you allow the people to feel that you're not related to the product, uh, they'll be more honest. They'll feel more secure talking to you and really say what they feel about the game, about the interaction, about everything, any question that you'll ask them. The moment they feel that you are part of the product, that they, you are actually the company who made this, uh, they'll have issues talking uh, straight to you. So you really need to make sure that when you talk to people, when you do play testing, uh, if you're the person who's going to do it, make sure that they think you're not part of the company. So who and how do we build that? So let's start with the audience. And I have a typo here. Uh, so the, the baseline that you want to create between five to 10 individuals uh, of mixed gender and a spread age. This is your basic core audience. Now, when you start with the prototyping, you won't be able to find an exact you know, audience that, you, that you're looking for. You will go basically to wherever you can. It will be maybe friends of friends. That's the best thing because obviously your friends will know that you're working on the product. So you want friends of friends. It can be approaching them through social media. It can be, and I've done this, uh, you know, while driving the bus, well, while, while, you know, uh, uh, using the bus or a train. The amount of times that I, you know, talked to people on the train or on the bus and told them, hey, you know, uh, I'm testing this game and I, I would love to see what you think about it. Usually I, I look around and I notice who's playing on the bus, who's playing on a train. Uh, I'll ask them, you know, hey, what kind of game are you playing? You know, oh, that, you know, I like the, you know, I love that game. Yeah, cool. I have, I have a game I'm actually testing. Uh, do you want to try it? I never found one person, like in, on an airplane, I found people. Not once did I get an answer of people saying, oh, no, no, I, um, I, please, I don't want to play a new game. Never happened to me. Uh, they're usually really enthusiastic about trying something that nobody tried before them. Uh, so either it's on the prototype and you have a first playable, and the same goes even when, you, when you're, or you're on alpha or beta, uh, you can really talk to these people and just bring them wherever you meet them. And what you can do is at the end of the test say, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm actually doing more tests for this game. 
would be okay if I, if I get your number or email and I'll let you know when we're doing additional tests. Maybe you can come up to the office. Uh, you know, we'll do pizza, uh, pizza evening and, and people will come in and play the game. Again, I've done this a lot of times, uh, um, dozens of times. And I've done it with kids where you do need the permission of the parents and you need the parents to be there. Uh, but with, with mature audience, you know, with people who can vouch for themselves, who can come in and, and do this. And never have I paid at that stage for, for doing the tests. And I found people on the street, uh, in, in, on the bus, on the airplane, as I said. It's really easy. The thing is just to mix it around, to make sure that you have enough male and female, enough spread of age to get a clear image of who the, the audience will be at the end of the day. Uh, how do you start? So once you have your base audience and like anything in game, game design, game development, you're going to iterate on that, uh, on that audience. So you know what, let's, before we, we start uh, talking about the, the start and the flow, let's talk a, a little bit more about the audience. You want to create a list. You want to have a large list of people who will be able to test play your game. And you want to do two things. You want to create sort of a, a, a base kind of players, again, five to 10. And these will be people who will see your game throughout. You will call them again and again uh, when you have the prototype, when you have the alpha, when you have the beta, and you'll call them again and say, hey, uh, I want you to test the next stage of the game. And they will give you some kind of a story. They'll create a story in your mind of how people view your game and how you worked. And, you know, you'll be able to ask them questions like when I first showed you the game, when it was just a paper uh, prototype, is this what you envisioned? You can also ask them if, if you're smart enough, you can also ask them at the very beginning after describing to them what the game is uh, to sort of write for you, how do they imagine the game will look like and work? And then when you have the, the, the first game, the first alpha, you can, you know, discuss this with them. So you'll have those 10 people who will be sort of your benchmark. And then as you progress, you'll have more, uh, you know, 20, 30 women and 30 men. And you'll have uh, a few people who are 18 years of age and 30 years of age and 60 years of age. You'll sort of build that around uh, as, you, as you go and, and collect those numbers and collect those uh, emails. And you'll have the audience that you'll need. Because one of the things that you do want to do is mix it around and sometimes even not use the same people uh, throughout the tests. So you'll have a few people who will do the, pro the prototype and then a few people who will do the alpha and a few people who will do the beta, et cetera. So that's for the audience that you build. And really, you can really easily create them. Just go out of the office, into the street, walk around, talk to people. That's like the, that's the number one thing that you need to do. And also probably the toughest thing that you'll have to do. Uh, and, and I know most game designers would not like to do that, but you know, try, it's good, it's healthy. So how do we start the playtest itself? So we want to start from a basic flow from initial understanding and navigation. Th those are the three common things that we want to make sure people understand. Now, remember, I told you, we come up to them as people who are not part of the company who made the game. So we also need at this stage to make sure that we do not guide anyone when they use the product. We ask questions, we observe how they play the game, how they interact with the tutorial, if, you, if it's in a stage where you have a tutorial, but you never guide them. And you will have many, many frustrating moments where you look at someone as, as they play the game and the tutorial will say something. And you'll say, well, it's obvious he needs to tap. There's an arrow. There's an arrow. There's only one place he can tap. I made the, the tutorial so clear. It's like everything is dark and there's one thing that he can tap. And you'll see the player going around trying to figure out what they should do next. And at any moment, you should never, ever tell them what to do or, or point to what they're missing. What you need to do is ask them, how do you feel? What are the thoughts that are going through your mind at the moment? Allow them to express themselves. Better yet, try to make them, and, and especially if you can record them, uh, that would be the best thing you can do. Uh, try to bring them to 
talk about what they think and what they feel at any given moment. Sort of a, a you know a, a free form free form uh, kind of of internal discussion that they have uh, with themselves as they play around. So it would be something like uh, they, they'll read the instruction and then they'll say, oh, they, they want me to uh, tap something. I'm going to tap it. Mm, I tapped it and now this happened. So it's really going to be a narration of everything that they've done. That's the, that's the perfect thing. If you can bring them to do that, that would be the perfect thing to do. So at any moment, never tell them where to tap or what to do. Just if you see that they have a problem, ask them, you know, what they thought don't even say what's the problem you want to make sure you understand what are their thought and thoughts and and feelings at any given moment and when you'll go through the basic flow right through the basic tutorial or maybe it's the core mechanics so you'll go through the basic core mechanics and you'll maybe explain to them what they need to do and then you'll see how they interact you want to see if there's an initial understanding is everything clear? Do they understand why things are being done at any given moment? Right. One of the things that I see a lot in, in tutorials is you get to a point where people just tap around and they, they, they lost. The, they're not even sure why they're tapping. The tutorial is so long and there's so many things to do and it's so complex that they got to a point where they, they just tap. Why, why did you tap that? You'll ask them and they won't be able to answer you. That's a bad thing. Right? The moment you see them glaze over and just tap around, that's the moment that you lost them and you need to make sure that you break that down. Um, in general today, we know that a lot of the tutorials are broken into several days, right? the, 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 the initial engagement with the player. But still, I see a lot of games that do a lot of very heavy lifting at the beginning. And you want to make sure that everything is clear. So when you create a test, even if you are using uh, something like user testing or anything, make sure to also break it down uh, for every few stages. Every few stages, stop the players and ask them, uh, is everything clear? Now, how do you feel about this part of the tutorial? Uh, what did you like? What didn't you like? Create open-ended questions. Don't go with, with very clear, uh, specific questions that give a, a set of answers unless you want quantitative information. We'll get that to that in a moment. And the last thing you want to look at is navigation. Is everything clear? Do they understand where to navigate? And one of the things that you can ask them a lot of the times is, hi, I want you to go to your inventory, right? Or you can go the other way around if you're not sure about the clarity of an icon and ask the player, Hey, what does that icon do in your mind? Where do you think will that take you? What do you think will that do? So again, allow them to give you the information. Next, you want to test for curiosity, experimentation, and observation. What does that mean? It means that after, usually after the tutorial, because the tutorial is very strict, usually, and there's only specific things that they can actually tap on the screen, uh, you want to see what happens next. When, when you open the game, even a little bit, uh, you want to see where they're going. What do they test? Is there any curiosity within the game? Do they tap around to see what other section in your uh, game do? Uh, do they think or try to think about things that they saw in the tutorial and sort of guess where it is or where they take them? You also want to test for experimentation. Do players uh, go back and forth between uh, the core and the meta game? Uh, do they try things that uh, you didn't teach them to do? Uh, for example, if you build a race game, uh, you'll sometimes see players actually try to tick the car off the road and see what happens, right? Or they'll try to crush into other cars just to see what happens. Um, it's, it's the same with, with most every game. Uh, the more freedom you give in that game, the more experimentation you'll find. And you want to see that experimentation because it will give you insight into what kind of things players actually want to do. And sometimes, sometimes it could be stupid things and the player know it's stupid. For example, you create a, a, a sort of a soccer game and you see player actually kick the ball off the court uh, to try to hit uh, the, the people, the, the audience, right? And if you see that happening enough times, I would actually 
put in uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, an Easter egg where if someone actually does that, so an individual in the audience will catch the ball and throw it back, right? It's fun, it's, it's stupid, uh, but if you, can, if you have the resource and you can do that, that would be fun because you saw people actually doing the experimentation and if someone in your larger audience, in, in, the, in the real players, will actually do that and get a response from the game, they will love you for it. Think of, again, this is the point where you do need to think about yourself as a player and think about the experiments that you're doing with games uh, and, and how do you react when something as cool as that happens? Yeah, we're good. Uh, An observation. Observation is anything that, again, you need to make sure that they verbally uh, acknowledge and talk about what they feel and what they think because you want to see if there's any specific observation that you're missing. Is there anything specific that they think which repeats with several players and you know you need to 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 make sure that you take care of that um i'll get to that in a moment when we'll look at some data points that we got from play testing and what actually happened okay so observation is is the next big thing that you need to look for uh, again always ask for thoughts feelings and actions those are the main thing when you play test that those are the main thing that you want to to look into you want to see what are your thoughts at any given moment even when they're not stuck even when they're just playing around, you want to see, are they having fun? Are they, and, and when I started this, uh, a lot of time I thought like, what if, I, if I'll tell them to, to talk, you know, to speak their mind, um, you know, they'll, they'll get tired, they'll be annoyed because they can't experience the game. Uh, don't worry, people love to talk and they'll, they'll, they'll speak their mind. And even if, uh, if, if they're really engaged in the game and got into a moment, I don't know, depending on on your game, but if they got to a moment where they're very angry or very uh, stressed out, uh, they'll stop talking for a moment and they'll go through that experience. And then you can just ask them, you know, immediately after that, you know, you know, I saw that you stopped talking. How do you? How did you feel? What happened? All right, and see how they break that down. Remember that uh, most of us were not. While humans are very emotional, we are very bad at talking about our emotions. Uh, we usually say, you know, that uh, men don't talk about the, their emotions, but women as well, while they might speak about their emotions, trying to dig into and understand why we feel what we feel is not something that comes easy to the majority of, of, the, of, of humankind. So we really need to allow them to express themselves and try to bring them to talk. So one of the things that you can ask them a lot of times is, you know, why do you feel that? You know, or what made you feel that? So they dig deeper and deeper into their feelings as they play your games. And when you ask for actions, this is where you can ask for, for them to do specific things, uh, interact in, with the game in specific ways that you have in mind, that you want to test, that you want to look for. You want to understand, you know, they, they finished the tutorial. And let's, see this, let's say you have a, a strategy game and you want to make sure that they understood how to upgrade a unit. So, you know, you can tell them, upgrade a unit and see what happens, see where they get stuck, see what questions they have in mind. Do they understand their basic resources? That's another thing that you need to understand, you know? So when you ask them to do actions, you can also ask them, did you notice, did it cost you anything? Did you notice if it cost anything? You know, and see what, it, what they say. Sometimes we give extra uh, coins, gems, whatever you, uh, we give them so players can actually do specific tasks within, within the game at the beginning. And another good question would be at, at that point, see, you know, which resource is more valuable? So everything that you take for granted, you, you have to ask your players. You have to make sure that everything is crystal clear. So you can actually, you, you should have a list anyways of all the components of your game, game and screen. You should just go over it and ask players about those. What are they? What do you think they are? You know, how would you use them? Now, some things in the game, you do give them early, but they don't use until a later point. So you can ask them about, you know, people have been playing games for so long with mobile games that they can sort of think, you know, what will the, this be used for, right? And unless your game is very, very unique and, you know, special and never seen before, uh, most likely that they, they'll know exactly what uh, you did there and where it's going to take them. And 
I can't stress this enough. Lie about who you are and the relation of the game. Lie about it, no matter what happens, and and maintain that lie. Uh, it means more than just tell them uh, that you're not related. It means that when they say something harsh about the game, you can't take offense. Lying is not just something that you do at the beginning of this uh, wonderful relationship you'll have to them. It's also about maintaining it and making sure that they feel safe discussing with you everything that they feel. Uh, so you can't take offense. You can't argue with them ever, ever. You do not argue with test with, with play testers. You don't argue with them. Uh, they are they are never wrong, ever, 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 ever. Uh, the only person that is wrong is the developer, which is not you, right? So it's very easy. Uh, if something is wrong, if something is doesn't work properly, uh, even if you understand exactly what happened and why what they missed, uh, it's better to work with them and sort of allow yourself to see where they want to take this, you know, where they think the problem is and how they think it should be solved. And at the end of it, you know, since you are the, the, the tester, you can say, okay, so the way that you need to actually uh, act at this moment is you tap here or here, but you are not judgmental when you show it. It's not like you don't do it angrily. You just show them and you can even add, uh, yeah, you know, the developers really, really made that part hard to understand. You're right. I'm going to write that down and tell them. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. The affirmation is that the creators are being tested. The testers are fantastic, always. Everything that they do is fantastic. Everything that they bring up to the table is interesting. Uh, everything that they feel is right. And you never put them in a position where they feel judged. Because the moment they feel judged is the moment that you're stop, you'll stop getting uh, good information. Um, never direct them, never show them what to do. I, I, I went over it, but I want to, to reiterate again. Uh, you are here to observe. You are here to uh, uh, ask questions. You're not there to interact with them in any way uh, unless they ask for help or you see that they got stuck for a long time. Uh, sometimes we do things that you know we, we can't control ourselves. They sort of, they hover over something that they want to tap and, and you'll just shoot your finger, we'll just go there and say, oh, no, it's here. No, you don't do that. You, you, you hold, you come down, you hold yourself, and you allow them to explore uh, your game. Um, so what are the things that you can learn from? Well, I'm, I'm guessing just from the kind of questions that I uh, asked uh, through the session, you can, you can think about the type of information that you can learn. But I want to show you a few things that we've learned. Uh, so, for example, you know, feeling versus fact. So, our question uh, for one of our games that we have a machine that you spin. Uh, so, we ask, you know, on a scale of one to five, one is not enough to five is more than enough. How would you rate the amount of spins that you had uh, to play with today? Right, and we can see that uh, individual who said not enough, uh, another individual who said, uh, um, you know, gave two. Uh, you got two people who said they had more than enough. One person saying four, and then we had four people. Uh, five people saying, um, you know, they were sort of in the middle. So when you do, you know, when, when you do this kind of uh, uh, this kind of information, you know, quantitative research, uh, you'll have a lot of information that's coming in in the shape of these kind of answers, you know, specific things that you asked. And by looking here, you would say, hmm, it's sort of average towards the, the, the enough uh, kind of the, the amount of spins, right? I mean, five people said sort of in the middle and then uh, five, six, seven, eight, eight people are three, uh, four and five score. Uh, but here's the kicker. <laughs> they all got the same amount of spins, all of them, uh, the exact amount. It's programmed that way. They got exactly the same amount. So now the question is, what happened there? Why, if, if it's more than, if, if they got the same amount, why are not everybody in the middle? Or not everybody in the not, more than enough or not enough? If they got the same thing. So this is when you look specifically, this is from user testing. So as you can see, there's a, a button that we could have uh, pressed to, to watch the sessions. Uh, when you look at the sessions, you see you know, when they got those spins. 
The people who said not enough actually got because because the spins, the amount of spins that you'll get from the machine and overall is pre-programmed, but there's uh, a sort of a, a, a curve of when they could get it by chance. Uh, every person who got it early and then throughout the game didn't get additional spins, those were the people who said not enough. And people who started getting more spins towards the end of the session said more than enough. Because when you looked at the videos, you could see that they were already in a mental state where they wanted to finish that stage and go to some, do something else, but they kept getting more spins. So for them, it was more than enough. It was like, oh, come on, I, I want to stop that. I want to finish this. Um, another thing, you know, bias uh, that you can think of. Uh, another similar question about coins that you got, right? So again, a spread that uh, from two to five, uh, four people said that they got, you know, a three. Uh, three people said more than enough. The spread is weird. Again, the exact same amount of coins, period. Same amount of coins. Doesn't matter, that's what you get in that session, the same amount of coins. What happened? Again, you watch the movies, the, the videos of them interacting, you, you see what happened, and you see that what happens is that they actually got the coins in different ways. So some people just got them from the machine, some people from an interaction that we have there. And some people also, again, it was spread in a different way. So some got it early, some got it late. And again, it, uh, it affected how they perceived this information, this question that we asked them. Talking about perceiving things, let's talk about perceived value, all right? Two questions that we ask. Uh, what, would the, what would you like, uh, you know, what did you like best about the game? What don't you like about the game, all right? So we, we sort of gave them the options. So we see the uh, three people really love the graphic, three really love the building, the island, uh, two playing the slots, and one like the story. Uh, on the other hand, you know what they don't like. So we have six people saying the story, they didn't like the story. And then two didn't like collecting items and then playing slots. Uh, again, it's quantitative and, and it's not enough because then you need to understand what happened, right? And one person liked the story, six people didn't like the story. Um, could be the story sucks, but you need to better, you need to view and see what happens. How was the story, you know, the story is the story and it, it's, it's the game. So it's, it's pre-programmed. Everything was the same for everybody. So why did they like or didn't like anything, uh, something? Uh, collecting items. Why didn't they like the coll collecting items? Is it because they didn't understand the value of, that, of those items, of the collection? Or perhaps, and that's something that happened, is that the collection, uh, the item appeared at the point that wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't welcome. They were experiencing one thing they had, you know, they, they were doing something in the game and suddenly this pop-up came in and they, they got this collection and they, wasn't, they, they weren't sure what, what even happened. It, it sort of broke their, uh, you know, string of thought at that moment. And they were taken to another screen and they were just looking for a way out because they were in the middle of doing something. They were doing, they, they were attacking someone. And suddenly they got this collection and, you know, it wasn't clear what happened. So two of them said, you know, we don't like co collecting items. That's the like, number one. So you have to, when you do quantitative information, when you ask specific questions, was this part of the tutorial clear? And suddenly you see a spread where different individuals will tell you, uh, you know, you ask five people from one to five, how clear was it? And you get one person in every score, and you get such a spread, it means that there's another problem. You need to look at the experience. You need to look at what happened and try to understand why the experience was so different from each, for each one of them. Perhaps it was a language barrier. Well, maybe maybe the, the person gave one point about, you know, did you understand the tutorial up to this point? And he says, no, maybe the language was too complex. Maybe, uh, maybe for some reason he tapped on the screen uh, while there was an explanation and he, and he you know, skipped to the next thing. So he missed the, the explanation. He didn't even realize that. Maybe you mixed between story and action. And that's why they didn't really understand what's going on. And it was difficult. 
Um, clarity is, so here we ask, you know, from, from one to seven, uh, was this part of the game, you know, uh, how difficult was this part of the game, not the tutorial, the game itself. And we, we asked them to explain the answer. And you can see majority of people got, uh, gave us a, a very low score. It was difficult at that point. It's, it's the beginning of the game, but it's after the tutorial and still was very complicated. Uh, if you would just get a quantitative information, if this was from analytics uh, just coming in, you saw you would see churn at this point. You would see people just churning from the game at this point, and you would not really know why. You would guess that something is wrong at that point, and you would try to figure out what it is, and you'll try to search for you know technical issues, and then you'll think about... Uh, you know, maybe the UI is not clear. You, you'll start wondering what happened. Why are people churning at this point? If you do play testing, you could actually see what happened at that point. Those specific players kept on playing because they were play testing the game. But these are the same individual who churn your game. So now you can see what happened. What was difficult? You can ask them. You can look at them. Uh, for them specifically, it was a point where the tutorial ended and they did a few uh, steps by themselves, and they got lost in the in the screens, and they weren't sure what to do next. Uh, and because of that, we changed a few things, and we also added uh, a timed uh, kind of hint that after I think two seconds or three seconds, uh, suddenly something pops on the screen and, and sort of shows you where to go next. Uh, and and when we did that same test again, it actually solved that problem. Uh, Another thing, you know, how unlikely or lucky would you be to continue playing the game at this point? And it, uh, same test, and it makes sense, right? You saw the churn, you saw the people who didn't like the game, it was too difficult for them, so they won't even recommend the game. So you, you can also get this very honest information when you do quantitative uh, research into that. But when you combine it with the uh, video, when, when you can look at the players, uh, we got uh, actually a, a strange kind of answer because uh, the people who, the five people here who actually didn't want to recommend, so two of them said, you know, I'm not the kind of person who really likes to invite other people. I like to play my games by myself. So two out of five people who you saw, sort of saw that they, they maybe churned, uh, they're not the same people. And... You know, one of them is, and that person didn't want to recommend the game because he just doesn't recommend games. So when you just look at the numbers, you just look at the quantitative information, all you see is five people say they won't you know, recommend my game. But actually, two of them just don't want to recommend any game. They would never do that. Always remember, it's about the players. At the end of the day, we're not making games just because we wanted to create this thing and we throw it out and we don't care if anyone picks it up. If that's the case and you just wanted to make something because you felt a need to make something and once it's out, you don't care for it, uh, then I'm not sure why uh, you came to this talk. Uh, but if you came to this talk, you probably wanted this, this information. And then my message to you is to remember, it's about them. It's about the player. It's always about the player and it's always about an individual player. And you really need to understand that. And I hope that you saw from, from the talk and from the uh, few examples that I gave that if this is something that you can do, you can teach yourself to do. And the more tests you'll do, your arsenal of questions will get larger and larger and you'll learn more. That's why I said earlier that if the, the Playtesting itself is an iterative uh, kind of uh, way of working because you learn from players. You don't immediately fix stuff, but you learn what to ask next. You take your next batch of players and you e evolve on those basic questions that you asked. So I hope you enjoyed this talk and that you'll get uh, into playtesting as soon as possible because you'll gain so much and your games will improve dramatically. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ziv. It was a great lecture. So many useful um, 
facts and so much great knowledge. Um, unfortunately, we are running a little bit out of time, but we have dozens of great questions. So I kindly ask you to log in by the link I have just sent you over the email to right. the Q&A chat and just pay uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, to the audience to answer some questions. There are some really good ones and people are really excited to ch chat with you a little bit. All right. All right. I'll do that in a moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank and you for inviting me. Have a great Bye -bye. day and a great week.